Um, so thank you, uh, Lauren, uh, for joining us today. I would like to start with uh, with a few introductions. So this is part of uh, a seminar series that uh, we have uh, established. It's also a Hariri Institute uh, distinguished uh, seminar. And uh, the seminar series is on predicting and preventing. Uh, the, the next pandemic is in fact associated with one of the NSFP projects that uh, we have at BU and uh, also Lauren Mayers has one at uh, UT uh, Austin. And uh, the seminar today is co-sponsored with the School of Public Health Population Health Data Science Program, and also the Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. And let me take uh, just a second to thank Laura White and Debbie Cheng at the School of Public Health uh, for uh, helping us organize this, uh, this series. So the, the talk is, is on Zoom, is virtual, is being recorded. It will be available on the Hariri Institute YouTube channel after uh, the seminar. And I uh, would like to introduce our speaker today. It's a, it's a great pleasure and an honor to have uh, Lauren Mayers to be the speaker today. She's the Cooley Centennial Professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, also the founding chair of the Department of Statistics and Data Sciences, and the recently established uh, UT COVID-19 modeling consortium, which has been funded by NIH, uh, CDC, and other, uh, other uh, federal agencies. Uh, uh, Lauren has pioneered the application of data-driven models and machine learning to improve the detection, surveillance, forecasting, and control of emerging viral threats. And in her work, she has built decision support tools, has provided analysis during the various uh, epidemics that we have had with uh, SARS, with the H1N1, Ebola, Zika, and more recently COVID-19. Uh, they have maintained throughout the pandemic a number of COVID-19 forecasting dashboards that, that have informed surveillance, response, and testing, and school opening strategies across the US and her group has published many papers on uh, on this topic. So Lauren also uh, is uh, one of the top 100 global innovators that uh, named by the MIT Technology Review under the age of 35 in 2004, and has received the Joseph Lieberman Award for significant contributions to science in 2017. So Lauren, it's a pleasure and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Yanis. Uh, it's really nice to be here virtually. Wish I could be there in person. I see it's a relatively small group, so do feel free to jump in and interrupt me if you have questions or want me to dive into anything midstream. Um, so uh, let me share my screen and get started. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, give you a little bit more of my backstory, and that was such a nice introduction. Um, uh, and what sort of led up to the work that we did during COVID and then specifically focus on modeling work that we did to support the city of Austin, Texas um, in navigating kind of the risks and policy options throughout the pandemic. Um, and I'll hint at a little bit about what we're thinking about in our PIP grant and would you know welcome the opportunity to uh, see if there's opportunities to work together going forward. Okay, so I've been... Um, working in the field of building models to support planning for future pandemics and responding to urgent threats for almost 25 years. And um, this is an example of work that we did in the aftermath of the 2009 pandemic for the state of Texas. So the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, as some of you may or may not remember, um, was really scary at first, but then turned out to be quite a mild pandemic in the scheme of pandemics. Um, and so we took the opportunity afterwards to say, what if that had been what much worse? Um, what kind of uh, policies would we want to have in place? How could modeling have helped? What kind of decisions were difficult and would only be more difficult in you know, something like COVID? And so we built a bunch of modeling tools. What you see here is um, a simulation tool, um, a user-friendly interface that can be run on a desktop or a, a laptop where the user can specify a, a pandemic threat. They can specify how um, fast it transmits between different age groups, how deadly it is, uh, whether and what kinds of vaccines are available, drugs are available. They can run these scenarios 
uh, and press pause and deploy things like school closures. So um, it was really, you know, quite versatile. And it even one of the nice sort of prescient features of this tool that we built back around 2011 was it allowed the player or the, you know, the simulator to watch a pandemic unfold in the state of Texas through the lens of an imperfect surveillance system where we were getting noisy or biased data so they could really experience uh, what it might look like when you're trying to make sense of a very rapid and uncertain situation. So we built this tool. We even built a version of it that could be deployed in this multi-panel display on UT's campus in a, in a room called the Visualization Lab. This is actually a photo of uh, a former uh, grad student from my lab who is now on the faculty at Northeastern. Some of you may know him, Sam Scarpino, um, demoing this tool to a group of visitors that include representatives from NIH, other research groups, uh, CDC. Um, again, back around 2011. During that same era, we built online tools uh, to address a number of um, questions that the state anticipated they would face in future pandemics, including how many ventilators should we have stockpiled in a central stockpile, as well as in hospitals across the state in anticipation of mild, moderate, or severe pandemics. That's this top paper. Um, uh, how do we very rapidly set up um, vaccine pods around the state and determine allocations to those pods in order to serve communities that were not being served by kind of normal healthcare channels. These were, you know, underserved, more vulnerable communities. Um, and um, how do we use um, pharmacies across the state to rapidly and equitably give people access to uh, medical resources like drugs or, you know, what happened in, in early in COVID was um, you know, using pharmacies to uh, provide access to tests. So all of that was, you know, all this work was done long before COVID. But unfortunately, the 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 interest and the effort and the funding um, that came in the right after 2009 pandemic dried up within a few years. And the people who um, contracted this work from the state agency moved on to greener pastures. And so even though we anticipated and had tools to support a lot of the challenges we faced during COVID. Um, these were no longer at the fingertips of the uh, of our public health agency. They really weren't used um, because you know we uh, the agency individuals lost interest and lost track of of the, some really important science that had been done by us and many other groups around the country um, in the years just following the 2009 pandemic. But in um, in 2019. Um, we began a project uh, alongside, uh, I, I think, four other research groups around the world for the CDC. This was a short-term contract um, to kind of in parallel scale up the kind of tools that we had been developing for Texas to, to the whole country. So each of these different groups were working in their own uh, to develop national level simulators that um, would allow us to simulate different combinations of intervention strategies in uh, during an unfolding pandemic, we were focusing primarily on flu pandemics, but the goal was to have these very versatile uh, models that could simultaneously uh, deploy different combinations of vaccine strategies, antiviral strategies, school closure strategies, et cetera. But these models and this uh, multi-team collaboration was about 80% baked when COVID started spreading. The CDC turned to our groups as well as every other research you know, team in the world um, and said, you know, stop what you're doing, uh, recalibrate your models or build new models and help us understand what's going on with this new threat. So that brings us to January of 2020. And the requests came not only from the CDC to groups like ours, but they came from public health agencies, from schools, from the local level, all the way up to the national and international level. This is an example of a, an email that um, several groups received. I wanna say at least maybe a dozen from the White House Coronavirus Task Force shortly after Ambassador Burks took the reins. This was the subject line, urgent modeling requests. This will be a time sensitive and urgent request. Below, please see the series of parameters and outcomes we would like you to model. We will need whatever results you can achieve by the close of business Wednesday, East Coast time, or maybe the opening of business Thursday. Your results in that time frame will inform US policies. I think we received that email on Tuesday. So it was a you know, 24, 36 hour turnaround to do modeling work that typically would have taken us, you know, six to nine months, build the model, analyze the results, validate the results, fix your bugs, et cetera. Um, and so we, we raced to provide whatever, uh, whatever we could in that short timeframe. Um, so uh, 
we were getting lots and lots of requests like this. And we had a large network of collaborators, past, present, future, around the world, around our own university. And we kind of organically came together. Um, we had we got some additional funding from a, a donor, you know, sort of in lightning speed in ways that our, our agencies cannot do. And so thanks to that, that donation and thanks to kind of everybody, uh, even people who are from, you know, computer science engineering who didn't know a lot about um, epi epidemiology, but were, you know, believed that they had interesting perspectives, tools, skills to bring to it. We, we banded together, we formed the COVID-19 modeling consortium, which I led for, um, uh, well, we're st it still exists, but in a new form now, but it was really for over 18 months, um, we were getting together on Zoom on a daily basis, and we were trying to field as many requests as possible, sort of organically splitting off uh, to do analyses, to build models, um, as requests came in, depending on expertise, bandwidth, um, et cetera. So these are some of the faces, the many faces that contributed to that effort over a two-year period. The modeling we did was really diverse, but I like to think about it sort of along three lines. We did modeling to help understand the threat. How does it spread? Where is it spreading? Who's at risk? How effective are our various countermeasures? Forecast the threat, what we'll be doing in the coming weeks or maybe even months. And then arguably most importantly, take our understanding of the threat, our ability to forecast the threat and really inform, help decision makers make effective decisions about what policies to deploy, how to use resources in order to slow spread and save lives. So I'm gonna very quickly run through a couple examples from each of those first two categories, but really focus my effort on talking about the modeling we did to support decision-making at a local scale. So. In the category of helping to understand the threat, that a lot of our early work focused on that. The very first questions that we tried to answer using whatever data we could scrape together and, and models that we built very quickly were questions like, uh, you know, that there's this new virus in Wuhan. We don't know much about it. Is it spreading from person to person? If so, how quickly? How many people have already been infected? You know, these were in the first weeks of you know January and February of 2020 when the data and information coming out of China was really uncertain. And we didn't have a whole lot of confidence, you know, that the data was really uh, comprehensive and, um, and representative. And so to answer those questions early on, one of the first studies we did was we, we, we tried to estimate how quickly uh, it was spreading in, in Wuhan and how many people were already infected as of, I think that right before the Wuhan lockdown, so around January 21st. We didn't trust the data from China, so how did we do this? We, we used the data on the timing and location of the first 19 cases reported outside of China. So the first one um, was in Bangkok, but shortly thereafter, there were cases reported in Seattle, Chicago, other countries in Asia and Australia. Um, we had comprehensive data on daily global air travel from Wuhan to every other city in the world. And then we also had access to um, uh, ground travel, cell phone GPS uh, data uh, from the Weibo platform for um, millions of people um, in China that allowed us to estimate on a daily basis air, rail, and ground travel from Wuhan to about 300 other cities around China. So we sort of triangulated. We said, we don't know. There's this, there's this virus spreading in Wuhan at some rate, which we don't know. Um, and we know, though, how many people are, are traveling every day from Wuhan, and you can think about that as kind of a, a, a random sample from uh, this pot of growing infections. And so then based on the timing and location of where those first cases were, we sort of triangulated and estimated what was that exponential growth rate um, uh, in early uh, January. And what we estimated and uh, put out there you know, to the public health community by a few days before the Wuhan lockdown was an estimate that the um, virus was uh, doubling um, in prevalence about or an incidence about every seven days. And that by the time of the Wuhan lockdown, when China had reported only 425 cases, this is a log scale, there were probably somewhere um, over 12,000 cases. And those early, very early estimates based on 19 cases reported in other countries were, were soon corroborated by uh, other sources of data and analyses. And we also estimated that at that time, uh, the time of the Wuhan lockdown, there were at least 100 other cities that had uh, outbreaks brewing but were yet undetected. The second question that we 
address that also was about characterizing this early unknown threat was uh, targeted the question of how um, quickly was this spreading from person to person? Or for those of you who you know are familiar with epidemiology terminology, what is the serial interval? Um, if I get infected and then infect you, how long between me first feeling symptoms and you first feeling symptoms? And so we worked with a team of Chinese students to scrape the websites of about 18 public health agencies from different provinces across China, looking for case reports that actually reported, you know, this person got infected, they first felt symptoms on these days, on that particular day, we did our sort of epidemic detective work and we identified who was the person who most likely infected them. And these are really early cases. So it was like a person had just gotten back from Wuhan um, and they infected their spouse. And so we knew something about the symptom onset of the most likely infector and something about the symptom onset of the most likely infectee. We found about uh, 450 case reports that had that information. Uh, from which we could approximate the serial interval. And what you see here is really the sum total of the analysis, which was a histogram of based on those 450 case reports um, showing the distribution of those serial intervals. And when we made this graph and we looked at this graph, our jaws dropped. Um, we were up till this point in time, and this is early February, we were assuming that this SARS virus would we had had sort of a pace of transmission or pace of infection that might be similar to the first SARS virus. Um, we were, I think, hoping that that for the first SARS virus in 2003, 2004, somebody got infected. They weren't infectious until they started developing symptoms. And it usually took them about eight days to go from you know their symptoms to the next person's symptoms. Well, we looked at this and there were two things that were incredibly alarming. This virus was spreading at about twice the pace of the first SARS virus that with an average serial interval around four days between me getting symptoms and you getting symptoms. And then we also observed these negative serial intervals, which meant that you actually started developing symptoms before I ever developed symptoms, meaning I must have infected you while I was asymptomatic. And so this was one of the first indications that we were de dealing with a very rapidly spreading virus that often um, spread silently, spread from people who didn't yet have symptoms or may never develop symptoms. So that was some of our early work. and. Um, and so then I'll, I'll turn now my attention to um, a little bit of the work that we have done and are continuing to do to build models that help us uh, project um, hospitalizations and deaths uh, due to COVID. Um, the very first uh, forecasting like analysis we did was in response to a request from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. They asked us to project how many people would die from COVID in 2020. And this was a request that was made you know, early in February or March um, of 2020. And in response to that request, we said we can't possibly forecast that. You know, Not only do we not have the models and the parameters, but you just can't forecast that time horizon for this kind of a threat because it totally depends on how we respond to the threat. Um, and so we said, we won't give you forecasts, but we'll give you some scenario projections. These are sort of if then projections, you know, if we lock down, this is what will happen. If we don't, this is what will happen. And our scenario projections look something like this. These are on the Y axis. This is projected deaths from COVID in the US through the end of 2020. And the, the three different bars you're seeing are these three sort of extremes. If we don't do anything to control the virus spread, we anticipated that there would be well over a million deaths in the United States by the end of the year. If we completely lock down in the way that we were locking down in mid to late March and we figure out a way to prevent transmission as much as we were able to uh, during that period, we believe that uh, we would see fewer than 50,000 deaths. But if we do something in between, which is essentially the roller coaster that we rode throughout 2020 and, and 2021, we anticipated somewhere between you know, 200,000 and 600,000, depending on the scenario. And in fact, at the end of 2020, the official death count in the United States was around 350,000. And um, studies that try to estimate true deaths due to COVID, accounting for unreported deaths, um, using um, kind of excess mortality and other, other methods, uh, put the death count um, above 500,000. Since then, um, we have developed the, our, the broad team of collaborators that I flashed up there earlier. Um, and along with um, many, many dozens of other research groups around the world have developed a, uh, a very diverse and increasingly powerful 
portfolio of different kinds of forecasting models. Um, a lot of this uh, effort has been um, uh, uh, pushed forward and supported by the CDC's uh, COVID forecasting hub. Also, CDC also has an influenza forecasting hub. There's a large overlap between the groups that are developing models to forecast COVID and forecast flu. And we continue to build and improve models and submit weekly forecasts. This is, I think, our most recent submission to the CDC's forecasting hub using our latest model uh, for forecasting COVID hospitalizations three to four weeks ahead. Um, and we do it at the state and the national level. You can see these state forecasts for COVID are COVID hospitalizations are roughly laid out according to where these states lie geographically. That's all I'm gonna say about forecasting. And now I'm gonna turn to the final bin of the kind of modeling work we do, which is uh, modeling to support decision-making. And the, all of the kind of modeling we do to support decision making relies on us having good parameters, understanding the threat, having decent models that can help us project what the what the threat will do um, under a variety of scenarios. So I'm going to specifically talk about work that th that large consortium of people did over a two year period, and it's actually still ongoing, but really intensely over a two year period to help Austin navigate the pandemic, and that's the city I live in. Um, many of you may have been here. If not, you should come. It's a, it's a great city. Um, this is a picture of our skyline here. Um, we have burgeoned. When I came to Austin and moved here in 2023, 20, I think we were about a million and now we're over 2 million people in the metro area. It's growing like crazy. It's bursting at the seams a little bit, but it's still a wonderful city. We're known for our live music. We love our sports, which made it very hard to do some of the lockdowns um, that had to happen, you know, around in Austin elsewhere. This is a picture, a satellite picture, but this is also a picture of Austin that's really important in thinking about um, uh, public health. This is a picture of Austin um, showing the um, racial and ethnic makeup of the city. Um, blue indicates uh, census tracts that are uh, majority white, and um, the darker the blue, the larger the majority. Yellow represents um, census tracts that are majority uh, Hispanic and darker yellow means the larger the majority. Um, green is majority black and pink is majority Asian. We are an incredibly segregated city, racial and ethnically and um, socioeconomically, roughly speaking, the, the east half of the city, the uh, Hispanic majority part of the city is much more socioeconomically vulnerable than the west half of the city. So that's, that's the city. And I had the privilege of serving on Austin's unique executive COVID-19 task force. We still meet occasionally, but we, we met very regularly, sometimes up to four times a week um, in the heat of the pandemic and at least once a week, um, in, I think through the end of 2022. Um, and it's a unique task force as I looked around the country, would talk to other modeling groups, would hear from uh, other leaders in our city that uh, we, we were really unique in um, its, um, uh, its longevity. You know, we met together for a long time. It's um, interdisciplinarity. It really brought all stakeholders to the table and, and collaborativeness, really uh, collectively made decisions, um, looking to science, looking to data every step of the way. So the task force included our elected officials, our city mayor, our county judge, and in Texas, the seat of authority when it comes to public health policies and regulations lies with our county judges in the 254 counties in Texas. Uh, this was the first judge, this is the second judge. It included executives of the three major for-profit hospital systems that serve the Austin area. It included our public health authorities that lead our agencies, um, emergency agencies, public health agencies. And then it included um, uh, scientists and doctors from the university, UT, which is in town, uh, including the then dean of the medical school and myself. And I was really there representing uh, that large group of, of, of scientists who were all working together. Um, so this, um, thanks to, really to our elected leadership and our public health leadership, um, this task force led with science and evidence and careful rational thought from day one, um, not only in making decisions, but in communicating risks and cultivating um, public understanding and buy-in and adherence. Um, when we closed the city in March of uh, March 24th of 2020, 
Um, the uh, elected leaders went out with stylized versions of the graphs from our models to explain this is a you know news from KXAN and NBC News. This is a stylized version of, of the kinds of graphs I'm sure you guys are familiar with that came out early in the pandemic. Blue was the safe zone. That's our hospital capacity. This first curve is what would happen if we didn't do anything. We would quickly blow through hospital capacity and our, our healthcare system would look like the very, the horrible, the scary images we were seeing from Italy and New York City at the time. If we did a little bit, we'd prolong the inevitable. Uh, but if we really locked down, which is what we would do, we would, we would preserve the integrity of our healthcare system and give ourselves time to figure out what we needed to do in the long run. Um, the group, that task force, asked the, the modelers to help them navigate all sorts of questions, including ones about protecting vulnerable groups. Uh, there was one study we did to estimate risk to the construction workforce when the governor overturned the city's um, closure of the construction industry. This led to um, uh, uh, an attempt to educate the construction employers about how to protect their workers, but unfortunately, the predictions we made in this analysis, uh, which were that the construction workforce, which is about 50,000 people, largely vulnerable, majority um, Hispanic, um, would probably suffer a five-fold higher risk of being ending up in the hospital with COVID than um, other people from similar age groups at different occupations. And we made these productions in April, and the city started tracking occupation in, in our Hospital, hospitalization data, and, and very sadly, despite efforts to um, educate and protect this population, very sadly, our predictions came true uh, with remarkable accuracy. Um, we also, and this was led by an undergraduate, we also did some calculations to help the city figure out how many hotel rooms they should procure as isolation facilities uh, to protect the populations experiencing homelessness um, if and when the uh, the pandemic started impacting that community. They procured about 200 hotel rooms and um, at the peak, they needed almost all 200, but they had enough. We built a bunch of dashboards um, uh, that uh, provided for healthcare forecasts for Austin and for other cities around Texas that we maintained uh, up till just a couple months ago. Um, they were widely used. Uh, by the public and by local authorities. Um, what we put on these dashboards, we um, uh, kind of tested, beta tested, and, and improved uh, in conversation with the task force and with um, news outlets, uh, including uh, providing estimates for the reproduction number, the probability we're in a growth phase, and what has happened over the last 14 days. We also built other um, dashboards to help visualize um, socioeconomic disparities and to help schools and other um, uh, entities uh, estimate um, the risk of opening any particular week, depending on your county. Um, and we, we put out a lot of our analysis as rapid reports, self-published on our website, not peer-reviewed, although we did our best to kind of review internally. Um, there are dozens of them. Most of them will never see the light of day in terms of a peer-reviewed publication, but they were helpful at the time. Um, the city leaders asked for this kind of documentation so they could point to it when asked why did they make decisions or how do they know such and such. So, but the, what I wanna spend the rest of my time talking about is um, what I think is uh, one of the, what was one of the real keys to Austin's success that the scientists and the consortium um, helped to, uh, to help to design. And that was, our staged alert system, which, you know, there are lots of different staged alert systems. You maybe have had one in your own city um, or state. And this is a, a system where we're tracking some kind of data indicators in real time. And depending on the level of that data indicator, that key indicator, we're changing our risk level and we're changing policies, we're changing messaging accordingly. So Austin's risk system, risk alert system, um, specifically tracked the seven day average in new COVID admissions. So how many people were coming in in the previous week um, into our local area hospitals for COVID? It is the one and only indicator we tracked from day one until today. Um, we also use that one and only indicator uh, in doing our healthcare forecasts. We determined very early on 
that it was the most reliable and timely source of data. It was not available from day one on a national scale, but once the scientists said, hey, this is the, this is the best data for us to be tracking, the task force, which included the executives from area hospitals, compelled the hospitals to provide that data on a daily basis uh, at a time when it was very cumbersome to do it. So you had to have someone dedicated to identifying which cases were likely uh, COVID and providing that in a spreadsheet to the city and kind of some validation in there. So that is what you see here. And this is the city's own dashboard that they uh, maintained for two years. That is that an indicator. And then we had very specific thresholds uh, that were really consistent through time. When this indicator crossed the line between yellow and orange, the messaging changed, um, the policies changed. And as we were approaching these thresholds, city leadership was going out there in the news and saying, hey, guys, slow down, you know, we're, we're approaching this threshold. If we hit this threshold, we're gonna, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna have to get stricter. Or as we were approaching the threshold on the way back down, they'd say, hey, we're doing well, keep up the good work. Pretty soon we're gonna be able to loosen things up. So um, I'll talk in a minute about the science behind it, but I think the key to its success was, you know, it was a good, it was a well-designed system. We helped with that, but really the key to its success were those local authorities and kind of collaboration with media and news outlets to really help the public understand this, to um, uh, cultivate buy-in, to be transparent, to be out there every single day. So these are just, you know, uh, five of the hundreds of screenshots I could have provided of, this was our local pu public health authority on the news one night, talking about uh, us coming back to stage four when things were loosening up. Um, this is our mayor talking about actually how the system was designed um, when he, and he says to the city in this one, he's thinking about, oops, sorry, he's thinking about, uh-oh, that just, my screen sharing is paused, sorry, let me just try to get this back, okay, um, he, he's thinking about a 35-day lock-in, and he's letting the public know he's thinking about this, and why he's thinking about this, this is the second public health authority talking about it, this is our mayor uh, giving a Zoom on, um, Oh, he was—he went out on Facebook all the time, giving uh, little videos. Um, and these are just two of our local um, uh, news reporters trying to explain the difference between stage three and stage four to the public. So let's talk a little bit about the design of the system. We designed it in April 2020, and um, we we designed it using models and using optimization uh, machinery. And whenever you're trying to design a policy. You have to say, what is this policy for? What are the goals of the policy? What's the objective of the policy? And we spent a long time um, as a task force thinking about if we are going to design a policy to help us navigate future risks and make decisions, what is it we want that policy policy to accomplish? And you know, this was at a time where we didn't really understand at a deep level kind of the costs of the various measures. How much was closing schools gonna impact students? How much was closing business gonna impact livelihood and mental health and all those things? And so we knew we wanted to do two things, but we didn't have a lot of good data to really dig in and make a detailed model. We wanted to, we had a public health goal and we had a socioeconomic goal. We said that we can all agree on the fact that we wanna keep our hospitals under capacity. You know, if our public health goal had been let's minimize deaths, let's prevent as many deaths as possible, the answer would have been to keep things totally shut down, right? Like that's, you know, that, and that was unfortunately not a, a politically tractable goal, but everybody, no matter whether you were in the governor's office or in the mayor's office, whether you were on the right or the left, everybody could agree that we did not want our hospitals to look like the hospitals in New York or the hospitals in Italy. We wanted to make sure to preserve the integrity of our healthcare system so that everybody could have access to safe, and rapid healthcare no matter what throughout the pandemic. So we all agreed that was a reasonable, tractable public health goal. And then we, like I said, we didn't really have the expertise or parameters or, or machinery to model the socioeconomic impacts of different kinds of non-pharmaceutical interventions, but we could all agree that what we wanted to do was to avoid stay home measures, right? We wanted to keep our stages in the blue and the green as much as possible and avoid red and orange as much as possible because the more time in red, the harder everyone would be, harder off everyone would be. So we turned those into mathematical equations when we were 
um, building the staged alert system. So how did we actually do this? Um, I'm gonna whiz through this, assuming that uh, I can answer things in questions, but also some of you, many of you are familiar with um, the way we build and use mathematical models in epidemiology. So we built a really sort of elaborate compartmental model, but it's like many compartmental models you've seen uh, where we use differential equations or stochastic differential equations to model the changing numbers of people in different, different categories, not yet been infected, currently infected, recovered in the hospital. Um, we, we stratified by age. So we had a lot of different age groups in Austin, each one with its own set of boxes. We also stratified by risk. So we had a set of boxes for high risk young kids, low risk young kids. We included separate boxes for people who had ultimately for people who have been vaccinated, et cetera. So this was actually a, um, a compartmental model for the city of Austin parameterized by locals or census and other data that included thousands of compartments, thousands of differential equations. Um, and so th that was a mathematical model that would simulate the spread of COVID-19 in Austin. And we tried to validate it with whatever data we had and we, we fit it to hospitalization data to estimate transmission rates. But what did we do? So what do we do that was special with this model? Because this is you know, what a lot of different models look like out there. We explicitly incorporated an alert system into the model. So we had in the model alert stages. So these are actions that change the transmission rate in the model. The model is cranking away and suddenly the, the hospitalizations in the model hit a certain threshold. And when that happens in the model, we, we assume that policy changes in a way that changes the transmission rate, higher or lower. So we're actually simulating tracking hospitalization data and changing the transmission rate when we hit those thresholds. So we're, what we're specifically tracking is in the model, what is the simulated seven day moving average of new hospital admissions? And when the key indicator hits key thresholds, we change the alert system, which changes the transmission rate. So we can simulate any alert system we want, one with this threshold, this threshold, this threshold, this threshold. And what we did was we used this simulation to figure out what were the best thresholds. Where should we draw those lines between yellow and orange, et cetera? And so we applied stochastic optimization to solve for thresholds that do two things, give us a 99% guarantee that we will, if we apply those thresholds in the real world, we won't ever hit the point where we don't have enough ICU beds. So it's a 99% uh, guarantee that we're gonna um, satisfy our public health goal. And then we also find thresholds that minimize the expected number of days under lockdown. What we actually did was penalize the, the simulation for every day spent in red, penalize a little bit less for every day spent in orange, a little bit less than that for every day spent in yellow. And in that way, find thresholds that you know, help us spend as much time as possible in the most open stages. This approach is described in two papers. Um, one, um, the first one in PNAS was sort of a proof of concept where we just had two stages. And the second one, which is in Nature Communications, um, describes uh, in uh, all the gory details, the analysis that we did to design the alert system for Austin. And it includes the graph you see there on the right, which is the model fitted to data and then projected out past site. That would have been September of 2020. What would happen um, under a bunch of stochastic simulations if we applied that particular set of alert levels, which are indicated in the different color bars. Um, one thing uh, that you'll notice in the list of authors in the Nature Communications is that includes scientists, doctors, but also um, at the time, our local public health authority um, and our mayor and the dean of the medical school who was really you know, bringing the scientists and the doctors to the table with local authorities. Okay, so we built this policy using this approach and we built this stage alert system using this approach um, in April and early May was we put it out in public. We started, we adopted it and we started socializing the system with the public in May, but we had to do a lot of work for almost two years to continue to pressure test the model, improve it, I'm sorry, the policy, improve it and change it as needed. So for example, um, we realized in June that we actually had more hospital capacity uh, than we thought when we first started, when we first designed the system. So that allowed us to raise the red trigger a little bit. We went back to our, our supercomputers, we redid the optimization with the new hospital capacity and we, we changed the triggers. Uh, but then we realized we all made a huge mistake. Everybody on the task force made a huge mistake. And we, do, we to this day, we don't know how we did this, but we were assuming that our, our limiting capacity in our hospitals was the number of general beds that we had. 
to uh, serve um, to treat COVID patients. But what we realized was that we were going to run out of ICU beds way before we ran out of general beds. And so we had to go back in and redo the analysis with the constraint being uh, ensure that we don't exceed ICU capacity. That led us to lower the red trigger back. And then, um, and then things kept changing throughout the pandemic. There was a moment in time where we said, you know, we like this policy, this, this um, stage alert system, but there's still a lot of uncertainties. And what if it doesn't work? What if we see our ICUs filling beyond capacity? And um, what's our fail safe? And so it was at that point that the city decided they needed to know when they need to set up a field hospital, an alternative care site to accommodate overflow. Um, and so we did a, a different analysis to, but using a similar approach to determine what that fail safe trigger should be. And then we continue to change the model and as, as time went on and the situation changed. So this policy, this stage alert system worked mostly as designed. So remember it was designed to uh, ensure that we never exceed our ICU capacity. That line there indicates the ICU capacity that it was uh, designed to satisfy. Um, this is uh, the time series of actual reported ICU um, uh, admissions, um, I'm sorry, uh, patients um, in Austin during uh, the first two years of the pandemic. And you can see that during the four major waves we experienced through um, uh, 20, April of 2022, for the most part, it um, prevented us from exceeding capacity with the exception of the, the Delta surge in um, late summer, early fall of 2021. I would argue that that was, um, we went into stage three, five, three times. I would argue that this overshoot was due to user error more than the policy because we, the city actually waited a couple weeks beyond when the policy said to go into red, to go into red. Um, but this policy, remember, it wasn't designed to save lives, but I think it had, uh, well, it, it, along with everything else that task force did, and the fact, especially the fact that we got the general public to be very aware of risks and to be willing to change behavior as needed, it helped to save lives in Austin. And what I'm showing you here is cumulative mortality rate due to COVID, um, as reported by US News and World Report, through time for the five largest um, urban counties in Texas. The horizontal line is the overall statewide mortality due to COVID. Um, this low blue line is the uh, is for our major metropolitan county in Austin, Travis County. And you can see that through the end of April, 2022, which is when most of the deaths, by the time most of the deaths have occurred, um, our mortality rate was less than half the statewide average, considerably lower than uh, mortality rates in Houston, major metropolitan area in Dallas, San Antonio, and El Paso, um, which experienced a really deadly, devastating wave very early um, in the pandemic. Um, so that's Texas, which had a very kind of open policy throughout the pandemic. Um, but when we compare Austin to the four closest sized metropolitan areas in the country, so we're somewhere around 26 largest metro area, um, so the closest areas are Sacramento, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and Las Vegas. And the U.S., this is the na nationwide COVID mortality rate. You see a similar pattern. Austin, less than half the nationwide average, considerably lower by, than similar sized cities. So when I Google um, COVID alert levels, this is what I find. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of COVID alert systems that were developed independently by schools, universities, cities, counties, states, countries, workplaces, government agencies, et cetera. And uh, when you dig a little bit deeper, most of these, there's, it's hard to find documentation about how they were developed, why they were developed, how long they were used. I mean, in some cases, when you dig a little deeper, you can tell they weren't used very much. Maybe they were used for a few months and then they were changed or they were abandoned. Um, but there's, you know, there are, Many there were many many efforts, which suggests that there's something about alert systems that appeals to people, right? It um, it helps policymakers navigate uncertainty, have guideposts for what they're going to do, um, how they're going to judge risk. It it if used effectively can be a very effective tool in helping the public understand risk and buy in and adhere to to recommendations. Um, so there's something very appealing, but there was no, there's really no 
science and not even really art yet to how you develop these alert systems and how well do they work. And so um, we have started to go dig in and try to really understand what worked, what didn't work. How do we move forward with developing science around um, uh, and developing alert systems that will help us navigate future pandemic threats, but also just future pathogen threats or current pathogen threats in general. We have done some systematic analysis of the of a few of them where we've actually simulated them in comparison to the Austin alert system and asked how well would that system have achieved our goals of um, ensuring hospital capacity and, and keeping things as open as possible. We found that the widely used alert systems that were very useful and disseminated widely early in the pandemic uh, out of Harvard Global Health Institute were more conservative. So they certainly would have protected the integrity of our healthcare system, but they would have kept us closed down for many, many more weeks, if not months, than our system. Some were too liberal. This was the sort of whack-a-mole system that was used in France to close things down. Um, there are a few different indicators, but the main one was once an ICU, once the beds, 15% of the beds in the ICU were occupied by COVID patients, that's when they went and closed things down in a region. And according to our analysis, and according to also news reports from France, it was a little bit too little too late. So they should have they should have locked down earlier. Uh, this was estimated to not be able to prevent overshoots of the ICU capacity and actually result in longer lockdowns on the backside as things were brought under control. And then there was the CDC system that there was a number of things that came out of CDC, but the CDC finally came out with what was uh, I think a very good data-driven system, but it was a little bit, it was not until I think spring of 2022, but we asked what if this had been in place or um, earlier in the pandemic. And this actually is remarkably similar in terms of when you translate into um, the, the indicators we were using, remarkably similar to where the thresholds ended up falling to the, the system that we developed in Austin. And our, our analysis suggests that this would have been a pretty good system had we you know, implemented it much earlier and used it widely across the country. Um, so where do we go from here? This is my sort of closing remarks. Um, early in the pandemic, about six months into the pandemic, the New York Times asked me and a number of other people that were kind of working um, on the front lines or behind computers um, about 14 lessons for the next pandemic. And this was asked, you know, way too soon. We were in the first maybe quarter of the pandemic. But what I say then, said then is really, I think what, is motivating a lot of the work that we're doing um, now. And it's that we must overcome our collective failure of imagination. COVID took us by surprise. We spent decades planning for a pandemic that would resemble the viruses we already knew, particularly influenza. We didn't plan for face masks. We didn't plan for mass testing, stay at home orders, politicized decision-making, the devastating racial disparities that unfolded. And so looking forward, we need to prepare for a much broader range of threats and really think about these complex interacting forces of our environmental systems, our political and our social systems, um, our healthcare systems, et cetera. And so, um, you know, here are some specifics and I know that your group is working on these, lots of groups are, are thinking about this, our agencies are thinking about this, but we need to improve data. Um, and we need to, and in my mind, I think there's a, a lot of attention being paid to epidemiological and um, molecular data and biological data, uh, but we really also need to be thinking about ethical systems to track socioeconomic and behavioral trends, which dramatically impact the, um, the fate of unfolding um, epidemics. We and, and just as important as the data, we need the real challenge is translating data into actions that actually protect lives and livelihoods. We need better playbooks for known and unknown threats. We need to train the future decision makers to solve complex problems in the face of uncertainty. And we, and this is a hypothesis, and this is the focus of a lot of my talk, is that anchoring decision making around carefully designed alert systems can help to balance public health and socioeconomic goals, promote trust, and save lives. And we need to do this persistently. We have to not lose interest and build, um, build science, build systems, um, build expertise that are sustained even as COVID fades into the background. So with that, you know, we one of the ways that we are trying to push this forward is with our own PIP grant, um, uh, pilot grant, and uh, I can I'm happy to talk more about what we're doing, which is uh, helping to fund the the transition of our Center for COVID uh, Modeling to a Center for Pandemic Decision Science at UT. And with that, I'll put up the names of a lot of those beautiful faces you saw earlier, and happy to answer questions if there's any time remaining. 
Uh, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, letting us know about all of your activities. Uh, let me start with with a question, and then I see another question in in Q and A. So, can you give us a little bit more information about the models that uh, you used in order to determine spread and sort of predict cases moving forward? Where are these models based on modeling dynamics? Where uh, agent-based models, and uh, so first that, and uh, depending on your answer, I will have follow-up uh, question. Okay, um, so we did a lot of different kinds of you know studies, and um, we used a lot of different kinds of models. So um, we uh, and and the the model we used for any particular task depended on. Um, you know, what was the question we were asking? Who had time to do it? And what was their expertise? What model was already developed that was closest to being, you know, ready to deploy, you know, particularly early on. And so, um, so it's sort of an ecosystem of different kinds of models, but for, um, for care, so I'll just answer the ones specifically. So for characterizing the threat, the very first um, model that I described where we were just trying to estimate the transmission rate, that was just basically an exponential function. <laughs> so, I mean, we just we just assumed that there was some growth rate and we had this sort of sampling model on top of it. Imagine that you're sampling a population with a growing proportion of infected people. So that's how we imagined our travelers who were traveling to other cities and we were sampling it at the rate of passengers going from Wuhan to city A or city B. And we just, and so then we sort of did a, um, a Bayesian fitting to try to under, try to estimate what must that growth rate be in order for the first um, introductions in these other cities have to have occurred when it did. So there was no sophisticated epidemiology in, in that those two early studies I mentioned. So for our forecasting models, the the forecasting models that we used in Texas and that we used to do those first projections of like how many people were going to die um, in the United States. Those we used these big, like cumbersome um, compartmental models. So where, you know, it's not agent-based, it's not every individual, but we have a lot of different types of people and a lot of compartments for each person. So it's thousands of, you know, these stochastic differential equations. And this was some of the work that we were doing, I said right before for the CDC for modeling pandemic flu, we adapted that. That was this big, like, Meta population compartmental model. Every city had its big clunky compartmental model with a lot of compartments that allow us to do vaccines and drugs. So, so that is and and for our early forecasts of COVID in Austin, we tailored that to Austin. And the the one thing that we did that was you know, I think quite innovative at the, in the moment and really helped us with our early projections was we incorporated mobility data. So we. We didn't have, you know, we had some good like mixing matrices to model how different age groups transmit to each other that were from pre-COVID. But then once everybody started staying home and changed their behavior, those parameters had to be thrown out the window because those were based on normal daily activity patterns. And so what we did was we got our hands on some of this freely available cell phone mobility data. We used data from SafeGraph. Um, that they're, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they're, they, yeah. you know, they, they do a lot of different things, but one of the things they tell you is how many hours per day people are spending at home at, at the zip, at the uh, census tract level. And so we use that, we used, we actually use a, we did sort of a principal components analysis to use a few of the different safe graph values to get one composite estimate of how mobile are people on a given day. And we incorporated that into our transmission term and estimated in real time, the relationship between that term and, and transmission. So that we did, but then there were some studies where we, we did use agent-based models, but that was really, we used small agent-based models and that was usually for models where we felt like we really needed to do something at the individual level. So for example, we did a cost-effectiveness analysis to figure out how much testing should we be doing uh, you know, should we like in a school or in a city, should we be testing everybody daily or weekly or monthly or whatever it was? And to do that, we really wanted to factor in, you know, what, what does it matter when you test a person? How much does isolation after testing really reduce transmission? How long should we isolate people? So for those kinds of 
dynamics, you know, where we really care about the individual, we would build small, like 20,000 people or something like that, that was meant to represent a city of 2 million. So we could do the analysis quickly. Um, and then our latest uh, COVID forecasting models, which, you know, are many years now down the road, those are actually sort of hybrid models where we're, we're some of it's like black box statistical fitting to past trends. And some of it incorporates um, um, what we know about exponential growth and depletion of susceptibles. You know, the fact that you, you'll you eventually get these curves that end. Um, uh, so this, we're, we're experimenting with different combinations of map modeling strategies from learning from the data to incorporating the mechanics we sort of, we think we understand as scientists. Right. And you mentioned that, you know, depending on the, the types of individuals, there were different buckets that the model had. And also you mentioned about the spatial uh, resolution of the model that was at the census track level or? No. Or, or... Yeah, so in the, in the main models we used in Austin, we uh, didn't have any geographic structure, actually. It was all demographic and health structure. So it wasn't, it wasn't that big, right? If we, and we do have models like that at the census track, but those would be too big. Those are too big for us to run in an optimization analysis where you want to run, you know, thousands of simulations. So for the Austin model, it was just population. I mean, it was just kind of demographic and health. So lots of age groups. And then for each age group, low risk and high risk. So two groups for each age group. Mm -hmm. And then, but then there were a lot of disease progression and treatment and vaccination and healthcare compartments for each of those population groups. So that's sort of how you get to thousands, right? Is because there's just this, the, the SIR model turns out to be, you know, every letter of the alphabet in the sort of, there's a susceptible, the infected, the pre infected symptomatic, symptomatic, you go to a hospital, you get vaccinated for each of those, yeah. you know, um, 10 or 12 population groups. Yeah, thank you. So I see Laura White has a question. Laura, do you want to uh, pose the question yourself or? Uh, I don't know if Catherine can bring. Oh, I, can, I can actually see it. You want me to read it? I don't know if Laura's still on. I mean, oh, yeah. Okay. She says, I'm curious how you think about using hospital data to set thresholds and track the pandemic. Many stayed away from this since it could be seen as a lagging indicator of infections and it might mean decisions based on this would be too late. Did this play out? How would you do things differently next time? Or what day would you prefer that is, oh, data, would you prefer it's feasible to get? Okay. That's, that's a great question. And um, here, and, and we actually talk about this a little bit in, in a, one of the papers that I, I mentioned in the paper that describes our forecasting model for Austin. So early on, there were, you know, five-ish kinds of data we could look at. Hospital admissions, total hospital census, so that's how many people today are in COVID, not newly coming in. Same thing for ICUs, deaths, cases, reported cases, and um, test positivity, which to this day, I really don't understand what that tells us. But um, anyway, the, um, the, you know, there's obvious problems with case data because of, especially early on, all sorts of different priorities with testing, lags with testing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we did worry about the lag. But then when we thought through it, when per somebody got infected with COVID, um, they, um, you know, at some point they developed symptoms and typically they were hospitalized you know, the, I think the median was around four or five days after the onset of symptoms. And if you think about how long till somebody tests and that test get reported, especially early on, it wasn't much different. Somebody has symptoms, they make it to the doctor the next day, maybe it gets reported. So the lag, there was not a better, less lagged option at the time, right? There was really nothing more immediate. And so, um, yes, we would prefer like, you know, everybody's testing every morning, you know, the second they have even a, a hint of virus in their nose, but, but that was not available. And to this day, there is nothing more timely available. Um, so hospital census data, if just as the total number of people in the hospital with COVID is really problematic, it's hard to interpret because some people stay in the hospital a month and some people stay two days and you got to back that out. So it's really, hospital admissions are really, um, really the, the best thing we have still to this day. And actually it is what the, CDC eventually turned to for forecasting for everything. So this is now considered the best thing we have for forecasting to look at. So, but you asked like, you know, what one of the things, so one of the things we did in designing the alert system is in our model, we incorporate that lag, right? So when we're simulating 
COVID spreading through Austin and we're simulating tracking COVID admissions as our indicator baked into that simulation is that we're not going to see, you know, the transmission that happened last week and or today and for two more weeks in our admissions. So our state the stage alert system that comes out of it is built to account for that intrinsic lag between the time someone gets infected and the time they end up in, in the hospital and the fact that only a small fraction of people end up in the hospital. And so because it's baked in, it's robust for that, right? You know, it's it, we don't assume that we're seeing it immediately. But, that's, but it's a good question. And I think there's, you know, a lot of work to be done on how can we accelerate our information about what's really going on on the ground. And, you know, there's really interesting work being done by groups to think about using wastewater and, you know, other other uh, novel sources of data to get at that. Uh, there is another question on uh, what techniques do you use to fit, uh, to, I guess, get parameters for the models that you are using and fit the, the right parameters that are there from the data yeah. that you have available? Yeah, I mean, in... Um, you know, with some of this, it's like dealer's choice a little bit, you know, who's doing the modeling, what kind of fitting do they feel comfortable with? You know, in some cases, there's some really good statistical modelers who, you know, built very tailored approaches. In a lot of cases, we used existing tools like from POMP, which is a really great resource um, to estimate transmission parameters uh, for compartmental models. So, um, it, it really is whatever people felt comfortable with or, you know, decided to design, design on their own. And um, um, so there's, yeah, it, the answer is a, a lot of different <laughs> approaches, but we, we use POMP quite a bit in, in doing our modeling for Austin. Yeah. And then th there's another question, which also gives me an opportunity to ask uh, a question I had. So whether... I guess modeling work and work that is done by a sort of certain group can be shared across other groups and you know other locales benefit from what has been done. And potentially a related question may be, do you think that there is an opportunity for policies that may not be uniform? So, you know, a certain a city, uh, a certain municipality may have one form of policies and that may depend on the local situation and you know another municipality another city may have a very different policy and we have seen some of that i think in terms of mask uh, mandates but not so much in terms of vaccine allocation so we had perhaps a, a national vaccine allocation policy uh, so is that a good idea or there is an opportunity for differentiating a variety of policies across different locales in the United States and, and more globally, depending on the local conditions? Yeah. Um, so the first question about can other groups benefit or collaborate? I mean, the, the answer is yes, that is, you know, that's, I have to say when we, when we came up with the approach to the stage alert system, I, I think I presented it to three different groups of the CDC. You know, I went into the, you know, when we would have these sort of impromptu Zooms with other researchers in my field, and I kept saying, this is turning out to be really helpful for Austin. You know, we really would love to franchise this, you know, do this kind of thing at, at a national level, it would really help people think through this. So I'm, I mean, we are, and, and, and the people who contributed this are actually from a lot of different groups. So this is a really, you know, multi-institutional collaboration. And so I think, you know, we, you know, throughout the pandemic, but even moving forward, we want to, you know, learn from other groups, help other groups, collaborate with other groups. You know, we take a very collaborative approach. We are we are um, enthusiastic participants in the CDC's COVID-19 modeling hub, the CDC's influenza modeling hub, the CDC's, I'm sorry, forecasting hub, forecasting hub, and then they also have scenario modeling hubs, two scenario modeling hubs, which are longer term um, kind of counterfactual projections. So, and there are, you know, dozens of other groups and, you know, there's a very collaborative spirit and the CDC is really trying to push us all, us all forward and get us to talk to each other. And um, so we are very enthusiastic about that and would love to, you know, continue the conversation if you see opportunities for us to work together. As far as like, how bespoke do you want your policy? You know, like how, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that that is a really important question for PIP groups and, you know, the community be thinking about, you know, and, 
you know, one size fits all if it's too prescriptive is not going to work, right? I mean, even thinking back, like, I wish we had had the perspective um, to actually uh, at least divide Austin into two different subpopulations and think about what was appropriate for the different parts of Austin, because there were different risks at different times, and we didn't do that. And, and certainly, you know, as we broaden and think about the United States or other countries, it's not one size fits all, but so, but you you don't want to have to build a different system, a different policy, do different analysis for every single jurisdiction. So you kind of want to come up with policies. You know, my vision is you want to, it'd be great for there to be a national policy, but that has the right flexibility so that, you know, when you're telling a city to go from orange to red, the indicators are appropriate for that city. And what happens in going from orange to red is, is tailored to that city, right? So there's like some level of like, it allows things to be appropriate for the city, but it doesn't require you to start from scratch every time you're you know, trying to develop a new policy. Yeah, completely agree. And that's not what uh, uh, I meant having, oh. you know, every, no, no, I think you answered the, the question exactly right. Uh, uh, just clarifying, I did not mean that, you know, every municipality, every local develop their own approach, their own model. What uh, I'm suggesting is that, you know, maybe you have one system or you have sort of uh, systems that can cover large swaths of the country, but yeah. there is enough information so that the policy is always a function of the state, of the local yeah. state, state information, like in a Markovian type of model. Yeah. Uh, and having enough visibility so that that information is taken into account in determining the action and the action would be a local action, would apply yeah. in a city, would apply in a municipality, would apply in a state. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that yeah. makes, yes, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, All right. We don't want to hold you much longer. Uh, we already took a little bit more of, of your time. So thank you uh, so much for for this presentation. And uh, I really enjoy and I'm sure the others that uh, were part of the audience enjoyed it as well. And we are looking forward to continuing this discussion and possibly even collaborating now that we have this big project. Right. Wonderful. Right. So nice to see you and uh, nice to see you. the audience and I uh, hope to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.